And what's uh, great is not only are they specialists, they are both members of the circle. So it gives me particular pleasure to have to welcome speakers who are members. Um, both have written extensively um, in all sorts of uh, serious publications about uh, the wines of these regions uh, and are judges, lecturers, organized tastings, all, all wonderful qualifications. And um, particularly Daryl, who you may know slightly less. Um, uh, he's um, uh, American, uh, but not very, not all the way back because his grandparents were born in Croatia, which makes uh, the region particularly appropriate for him. And, uh, on the one side, on the one side, just half, <laughs> <laughs> yes. on my mother's side. Okay, and they emigrated to the States in the 1880s, mm -hmm. uh, in, in 1909, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, there's still a small family vineyard in Croatia. So, that, so, so that's great. Very small. Um, Daryl now is based in, um, in Vienna and Caroline's in the UK. So over to them to tell us about the wines of Croatia. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I shall get my screen up and hopefully you can see it. I think most of you, quite a lot of people know who I am and Daryl now as well from, from the introduction. So I won't waste too much time on, on who we are because we're here to talk about a country that I think possibly of all the countries I write about, which covers sort of Central and Eastern Europe, really from the sort of Slovenian border all the way across to the edges of the Black Sea. Um, of all the countries I cover, I think in some ways Croatia is the most complex and the most fascinating. Um, and it's very beautiful. And I think it could be a lifetime study. So, but just to give you a little bit of a snapshot here between the two of us as to some of the reasons why we think it's so fascinating and perhaps some of the reasons why we see less of less Croatian wine exported than we might like than perhaps the quality deserves shall we say so um so just uh, I mean I took this picture it, um, at a winery called Kozlovic in Momjan and this is a glass of Santa their Santa Lucia Malvasia with the church through the glass just to set the scene that we're talking about a beautiful place um, and as will become clear I think a very varied place. Daryl would you like to add why you're so passionate about Croatia or? Yes uh, you know it, it, it really has uh, it, it really has less to do with my uh, ancestry um, although, my, you know, on my mother's side, though, they, like I say, my grandparents did go over to the U.S. in uh, 1909. Uh, but um, I fell in love with the wines there. That was the real reason. I, I had actually been going to Croatian wine regions before I ever visited uh, the area where my grandparents were born. So um, I just fell in love with the complexity, the diversity, I should say, of the wines between Plavas Mali and all well, your, well, some of them are coming up, but just uh, and the stunning scenery, uh, the diverse scenery between the Dalmatian coast and then the inland uh, area, uh, which you'll see some photos. Um, it's it's that's what really captured my interest. And uh, of course, it's always in the background that, OK, uh, yeah, I do come from that country, part of me, <laughs> part of my family. Um, so that does add to it. Uh, but it, the wines were really, maybe it's uh, whatever came first. But anyway, the love of the wines, I have to tell you, very diverse. You'll see some now. Yeah. So always worth starting with a map just to remind people where Croatia is with Slo uh, Slovenia to the north, west, Hungary to the northeast, and then obviously former Yugoslavia, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina um, to, to the south particularly. And... Um, <clears throat> But you see from the shape of, you can start see from the shape of it, I'll show you a slightly better map actually in a second, to show you some of the key kind of geographical features that influence and make Croatia such a diverse place. So first of all, you know, strictly it is on the Balkan Peninsula, but Croatians like to see themselves as a, as a Adriatic, a Mediterranean nation, a sea nation. And I think you can see from, from here that, you know, the sea is obviously really important in Croatia. 
Um, and you can see from my background, this was a, a picture I took when I was at, just doing a project just in Dubrovnik last year, yeah, before now. Um, so the coastline and all these islands are massively Im important in how Croatia identifies itself oh, it's, and this massive uh, maritime influence on all the coastal vineyards from the Istrian Peninsula up here, all the way down the coast, the islands and so on. So that's one really important feature. Then of course to the, to the northwest you've got the Alps, so the the northern parts of Croatia, especially as you go inland, you get these cool breezes coming off the Alps uh, that moderate the climate. And then you've got the Pannonian Plain heading over into Hungary to, to the northeast. Um, and then, of course, as you head due um, east across Croatia to Slavonia and to as far as the Croatian Danube, where you know Vukovar over here on the right is very close to the Danube. It's actually really quite warm, but it's very continental. So you've got this coastal, significant coastal region, and then you've got these very continental, uh, really different regions um, with different climatic influences and different grape varieties because of these, um, you know, partly cultural, partly it's, um, you know, tradition and partly it's climatic. So you've got that combination, this real mosaic of, of, a, of a country. And then, um, and then you've got the Dinaric Alps um, further south that um, provide some protection from the, from the east as well. Um, so dug out a few just little statistics to, because uh, I, I always do statistics, right? You know this about me by now. So probably as far as we know, winemaking goes back to about two and a half thousand years, at least to the ancient Greeks and the Illyrians, possibly before, but obviously written records and so on are quite difficult to find if you go back into the history of the Balkan Peninsula and, and Eastern Europe. This coastline factor, you know, it's it's incredibly influential in, in terms of Croatian identity, nearly 6,000 kilometers. Admittedly, that includes the coastline around all the islands and it's about 17 or 18,000 kilometers without, so it's still an enormous coastline, um, even if you don't include these 1,246 islands. But actually, it's a relatively small country, four and a half million inhabitants. So that makes it like twice the size of, of Slovenia to the north, just over. Um, and then this number is really, really important. Um, very close to 20 million tourists in 2019. And I think Croatia's been now is a it's on everybody's bucket list. If you haven't been, it's one of those places people want to go to. Um, and that has an enormous impact on the financial viability and pricing and exports and so on of the wine industry that we'll maybe talk about a little bit later. Like many places, like most places, obviously tourist numbers have been um, hit hard by COVID. Interestingly, and I'll just mention this now while we're talking about tourists, Istria wasn't hit very hard whereas Dalmatia was. And I think part of the reason for that is that Istria is drivable from Austria or Germany. And over the summer, Aust uh, Istria was relatively safe, not many COVID cases and the borders were open. So people could still drive from mainland Europe into, into Istria, whereas Dalmatia is a sort of a long way. And you either have to get a plane or it's, you know, it's a, or a boat um, cruise ships and so on. So actually, not so many people can drive, you know, it's a long way to drive, shall we say. <laughs> so um, Dalmatian tourism, um, and Dubrovnik particularly being so far away um, from kind of the core of mainland Europe has been hit really hard. So I think that's going to have an interest as that unravels over the next year or two, that'll be an interesting story to keep an eye on. Okay, so currently just under 19,000 hectares under vine. And I think this number is really fascinating that there are nearly 27,000 wine entities in the register. Now that's going to include vineyards and it's going to include wineries and it's going to include cooperatives and bottlers and maybe Daryl's little family vineyard is one of those, those entities. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, 
and kind of 1575 or so producers um, so that will be registered wine registered to be able to sell wine um, but a relatively small number of kind of commercially sized wineries there's only 145 producers with over 10 hectares of vineyards and if you go up to like 200 hectares it there's like six producers so there aren't very many producers who can do volume cheap winemaking um, so that's another factor in the in the Croatian picture um, so pretty small harvest in 2019 um, just over half a million hect hectoliters and it's 75 percent ish three quarters of it's white um, little bit of rosé that's probably less rosé than many as a share than many countries so again that'd be an interesting topic to explore mm. exports relatively small just 10 percent basically of of the 2019 harvest um, and it, net imports obviously are five times the size of the exports and a lot of that would be cheap wine from the neighboring countries that undercuts um, the production costs in Croatia uh so um just to sort of go back to um how the country is organized um and over the last few years they've the, the country's developed this division into just four regions which makes it much easier to communicate the complexity of this country i think so to the east slavonia and and the danube Slavonia you'll probably also be aware of as a really good source for oak. Um, Slavonian oak is very well known for cask for the big casks that the Italians use particularly because um, it's it's good quality oak but it's tough and it's very good for making those big strong staves for good good casks. And you've got the Croatian uplands um, um, in green. Um, and that's the region that's closest to Zagreb. So if you ever go to Zagreb, which is a fantastic city, some of the vineyards around there are well worth, worth visiting. And then in red, Istria and Kvarna. Istria particularly is a place that's quite close to my heart because I've been president of judging for the Vinistra wine competition for a few years now. Um, and I don't know, it's kind of almost like a little personal identity people that live in Istria see themselves as Istrian first and then Croatian or Slovenian and a little bit of Istria goes around into Italy as well so it's quite unusual in Central and Eastern Europe in that they're quite cooperative and they're organized and they do things across the border with this identity of being Istrian. Um, it's also a fascinating place in terms of its history because it's been Italian, it's been Austro-Hungary, it's been Yugoslavia and it's been Croatia. So I have a friend called Ivica Matosovic who likes to say that, you know, his family's lived in the same house for the last 200 years and the last four generations have had different passports. Um, so that kind of... I don't know, that connection to the geography of Istria, I think, is quite important for people that live there. Um, because that's been fixed, whereas their national identity has not been fixed. So I think people get quite protective about their geography when their politics have changed their influence. Uh, and then, of course, Dalmatia, um, you know, perhaps the most famous part of the country with all these uh, stony soils and steep slopes and some amazing grape varieties as well some dramatic scenery, some of which I'll show you in a minute. Do you want to say something about Dalmatia, Daryl? Well, again, it's, well, from north to south, I mean, there's so much going on. Uh, they, they, are, uh, they, they also see themselves as different from the rest of Croatia, the Dalmatians. They do, and uh, they're, they're very, you know, the Croatians in general, I think, are a very proud people, no matter which part of the country they, they're from. But, yeah. um, but in terms of in terms of wine, I mean, it's spectacular, and it's important to know. Interestingly enough, that with all that has gone on, you know, following the breakup of Yugoslavia, so in 1991, and uh, the um, small wineries establishing themselves and have now grown into bigger wineries, it's interesting to know that even during the Yugoslav times, in 1961, uh, Dingac 
uh, and Polship, these are two Appalachian sites. Uh, they um, they actually became Appalachian and it, in Yugoslavia. And now they have uh, World Heritage, uh, the UNESCO Heritage Site uh, status, I believe. And uh, But they were actually established as Appalachians back in the early 60s, during the Yugoslav time, during when Tito was a president, which is very interesting, I think. Yeah. For that yeah. For a country like that to, you know, to have. The only other one that you think of with such a history would be Tokai in Hungary, really, if you think in terms of that real, you know, prominent history. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point, actually. <clears throat> good point. Um, so just to kind of then sum up what I was saying earlier about, you know, Slavonia and the Danube, it's continental, but quite moderate, even warm. <clears throat> uh, the uplands are actually continental, but quite cool because of that influence coming from the Alps uh, to the north. <clears throat> Istria and Kavana is, distinctly Mediterranean um, and then Dalmatia dis very Mediterranean but warm Mediterranean and quite dry so drought is often a challenge in Dalmatia and that, that drives some of the grape varieties that are, are being grown. So I thought this was actually quite an interesting number that there are 16 PDOs and actually most wine in Croatia is being produced as a PDO um, protected designation of origin rather than, but in these two categories of Rahonska vino and Kvalitetno vino, which are both subcategories of PDO, um, just with slightly different rules of Rahonska vino is slightly stricter, obligatory tasting and so on. Um, uh, so, you know, quality wine is the majority category. Um, and if you want to know, these are the PDOs, very few of them that you'll see on labels. I mean, Dingach, obviously, uh, Daryl's just talked about as well. Um, but yeah, you've got to be really nerdy probably to want to know what all these are. And actually, mostly I think what consumers are interested in is the producer name and the grape name. And with, you know, a few exceptions like Dingach, which would be, um, you know, famous in its own right, shall we say. Oh, Is that yeah. a fair comment, Daryl? <laughs> yeah, that did it, by the way, when I said, did I say, I did say post didn't I? Yeah, I think okay, so. Yeah, it was because yeah. I've been so focused on post the grape. I was just starting to think, wait a minute, I hope I did say post yeah. <laughs> but I didn't, didn't see it there. It's interesting that Dingot <laughs> is singled out on its own there. Yeah, and um, post isn't a PDO in its own right. But... Which is very interesting. Mm. That's odd. Yeah. yeah. But there we go. Okay, so grape varieties. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you can, s <laughs> there are so many, I mean, they reckon there are about 200 different grape varieties planted in Croatia. Some of them will literally be a handful of vines somewhere. Um, and that's part of what makes the country fascinating. Um, obviously a good smattering of international grape varieties as you might expect, but I think what's really interesting is some of the local grape varieties. So particularly Grashevina in first place. So Daryl, over to you. Yeah. Well, yeah, Grashevina um, is the most widely planted white grape. It's the most widely planted, planted grape, but it's also um, uh, white grape. And uh, it's also known as uh, Italian Riesling, or in Austria, in German, it's called Belsch Riesling, or in Hungary, it's called Olas Riesling. Uh, but it is not related to the Riesling that you know from Germany, the Rhine Riesling. Okay? It is not that. In fact, uh, for many, many years, uh, the wine, it, it, and it still partially is seen this way today, as being a kind of a, a, a simple wine, a cheapy kind of a wine, uh, simple white, also a, a kind of wine that you would mix in a spritz or something, you know, in mixing soda water. However, <clears throat> and that's true in Austria as well, but it's been changing. And I have to say that uh, I've tasted many of this, this kind of wine, you know, the Grajevina or the Welsh Riesling or the Olash Riesling. Um, and I have to say that what's happened in the last 20 years has been exceptional. Croatia has a really, really beautiful example of Grajevina. Um, has beautiful vineyards. It makes a very good wine. It's grown a lot of the, the best Grajevina comes from the Slavonia region, okay, uh, that you saw um, Slavonia and Danube on the map on the in, inland uh, in the east of the country, northeast. <clears throat> and um, it is a very, it has a lot of acidity and it has a lot of the green apple flavors and it can have peat flavors. It, it varies. 
but the nice thing about it is uh, the winemakers there are, uh, you can have in dry style, you can have it in a dry style, you could have late harvest style, you can have a, you know, medium, uh, medium sweet, and it, it takes on all, all kinds of different styles. It's really, that's really wonderful. And uh, I remember when I started tasting it about 15 years ago, uh, the alcohol levels were surprisingly high on some of them. I mean, there were some were like 14% alcohol, which I wasn't used to tasting like in Austria, where I'm based in Vienna. And, uh, but it showed such diversity and uh, such complexity, um, especially around this area like Kutjevo, there's a winemaker, uh, Krauthacker, uh, Vlado Krauthacker, um, and he makes fantastic, fantastic versions of Grajevina. And, and uh, from dry, again, to the whole range, but he also, eaten, in fact, he's even making an amber, which is another topic to come to, but he's making an amber wine, an orange wine um, from Grajavina. Mm. The, and I can honestly say, just as a side note, that uh, there are two places that have really impre impressed me with what they are doing now with, with Grajavina, and that is Croatia, and this area particularly, Slavonia and that whole region, and also in Hungary, mm. uh, around the Balaton, the Caroline, you know, so around the Balaton, uh, the Lake Balaton, fantastic versions. North, of it. North shore of the lake, around a Balaton, uh, Chopak and so on, there's some fantastic, exactly. you know. Absolutely. And single vineyard versions now, as people are moving on from seeing sort of Grashevina Olash Riesling as the wine for making spritz, spritzers in the summer, to right. actually a grape that can offer real quality from the right sites. Right. Yeah. I mean, and Austria? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Hmm. No, I was just going to move on to Malva's ear, unless you've got more to add. <laughs> no, I actually, I, no, I, I could actually, but I won't, it's too much. But I just, let me do one little interjection is that because I'm in Austria. Austria has a ton of this wine around, you know, the Welsh Riesling, it's widely planted, but, and it's also making big efforts to make really good quality version. Um, and it's slowly working, but for me, it it doesn't come near what you can taste with the Grajevina in Croatia and with the Olas Riesling in Hungary. But really, there's enough of the Grajevina around in, in Croatia, so you have to try it. But it's important to know good winemakers because there is still some of that Cheapy stuff around. <laughs> Quite a lot of it. <clears throat> but the crowd hacker is one. Um, Ilotki Podrumi. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, Bil um, uh, Bilia. Um, or, or Belia, sorry, Belia. That's okay. it. Yes. Galich as well. I really like what they're doing in <clears throat> Galich. Is mod and uh, yeah. Yeah, some good stuff around. Um, yeah. Oh, Antonovic as well, right on the Croatian Danube. Mm. Makes some lovely Grashevina. Um, okay, so Malvasir also, there's been a bit of a similar story, I suppose, in that it's been a workhorse grape. It's really only grown in mm. Istria and also up into places like uh, Berda and the Vipava Valley as you go north into Slovenia as well. But it's very much an Istrian grape. It's not related to any other Malvasirs. Nobody as yet has tracked down any parentage for it. Um, so you know, as far as we know, it's likely to be Croatian in origin. And I think for a long time, most, most, and it, this is still true that most Malvasir Istaska is made to drink young by the seaside. Um, and an awful lot of it will be sold to tourists in, in Istria. And it does that quite well, though even that style has evolved. I mean, five or six years ago, there was a lot of, it was very much cool fermentation, probably, you know, 5% Sauvignon Blanc in there, you know, basically to mimic Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and I think people have got a bit more confident about the quality of the grape variety now and are letting it show its own characters. But the thing about Malvasir Istarska is it also has this amazing ability to do this diversity of styles. So you can have this fresh, slightly salty, quite mineral, summer drinking, quite easy and complex, you know, five to 10 euros kind of price range. But you can also have this whole range of, you know, um, skin contact wines, so which might be cold maceration or it might be kind of, uh, maceration with fermentation to make it in a more orange style 
there are people working with acacia because it really seems to suit acacia with that slightly honeyed floral um, acacia blossom character really works well with this sort of meadow flowers and green apple and uh, apple blossom <laughs> character of Malvasia. Um, and, you know, there are starting to be some really fa fabulous sort of skin maceration wines from this grape that can can age so beautifully as well. So there's been a huge amount of evolution in the last last few years with this grape. Um, it's incredibly food friendly and it's worth comment mentioning that, you know, Istria year after year wins the prize for the best olive oil in the world. And if you go at the right time of year, you have fantastic truffles. And mm. so, you know, it's quite a foodie um, delight as well as um, as a wine place. Uh, Daryl, you wanted to mention Tehran, which is the other important grape, uh, native grape in Istria. Yeah, um, Tehran is an, it's interesting. It's a typical Istrian grape, although there's not a whole lot of it, as you can see in Croatia, the Croatian part of Istria, there's only about 237 hectares. And it's uh, also known as Tirano, if you go over into Italy and Friuli in that, in, in, uh, that area. Um, it, it is, it's, it's a very confusing grape because it can be confused. It's supposed to be identical to a Rafosco, one of the Rafoscos, okay, Rafosco di Istria. Uh, but not the other, uh, not the other Rafosco. So, uh, and this has caused a lot of confusion. I won't go into the details now because it, it can be mind boggling. But if, if you ever heard of Rafosco, uh, sometimes it can be confused with that because um, this grape though, that has a lot of uh, acidity. It has a lot of acidity and cherry fruit. Um, it can be quite, quite electric in, its, in the way it expresses itself. And it, it, it's really lovely. I found some beautiful versions um, growing like a Coronica, the winery Coronica, which has this lovely uh, red, this red terra rosa soil, uh, iron type of soil. And uh, it, if you tasted it, uh, say around uh, maybe 15 years ago also, I mean, even today you'll find versions of this where it's just searing acidity. It's so, it's almost wow. Yeah. However, I, I discovered a couple of really, really uh, wineries that are doing a fantastic job with it, which just, it makes, if you, if you like acidity, they've learned how to temper it with just the right amount of fruit mm. and, and the concentration. So that acidity becomes very seductive. And so like there's a Pequentum, if you know Pequentum, uh, Brecevic who makes Pequentum, lovely. And Koronica, uh, Rosenich makes a very nice one. Um, I, I, if you can ever try it, I encourage it, but try to be an acidity lover. But it, again, with that cherry kind of fruit, um, it can really be a lot of fun. Mm. And uh, that's just my little take on it. What do you think, Caroline? Yeah, there are also some interesting blends, particularly Merlot and Tehran, I think works mm. really well, because actually Merlot in Istria, you wouldn't necessarily mm. think that you would think it's a bit warm, but actually there's some really cracking quality Merlots and they, but the terra, if you add some terran to it, it gives it that sort of crunchy raspberry freshness that makes it a really attractive combination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, no, interesting grape and, and the squabble between Slovenia and, and Croatia has, I believe, has been resolved. It has. The Croatians have to put that it's... Uh, Croatian Tehran on the label, yeah. uh, whereas Tehran in Slovenia is actually a protected designation for Kraški Tehran, which right. is made from Rafošk, just to confuse matters. This is it. This <laughs> is it. Yeah, and you, this little what Caroline's mentioning was this this little almost um, if I can say this uh, uh, um, almost like school school uh, child fighting between, you know, you can't call it that. No, yes, I can. And no, you can't. Yes, I can. And we had the right first. And da, 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 da. this all went on back and forth with the EU. But finally, thank God, after years, a good decision mm -hmm. was made where you say, yeah, uh, Croatian Istria on it, Tehran, Croatian Istria. It was the, uh, the Slovenes were against uh, the Croatians using that name Tehran uh, for because of that air, and little area that they have called Tehran, which is, but it's not made of the Tehran grape, it's made of the, as Caroline said, Rafosco, Rafosco, yeah. and uh, became really crazy. 
uh, really crazy, but it has finally been settled. And only fair because it's all Istria and it's all part of Istria and the grape grows in Istria, you know, yeah. and uh, anyway. Anyway, uh, Tanya makes a comment about Demjanic, uh, Borgogna, which is Blau Frank, recently, relatively recently been discovered to be yeah. Blau Frankish, and That's it's right. grown Frankovka in Slovenia, uh, Slavonia, just to confuse matters. And other grapes that I think are worth looking out for, Debit can be exciting, Poship, fantastic grape. I'm coming to uh, that. Zlatina, actually, which only really comes from the island of Kvarna, can be really good. Um, so there's a few exciting things to, you know, to explore. Um, you know, this is why people go to Croatia, right? <laughs> <laughs> the sun and the sea, but also the food and the wine um, really add to that story. So I just wanted to again show you a few pictures um, to sort of, uh, so these are all taken in Istria. This is Matosevic's Grimalda vineyard. And you can see here that the soil is quite white quite chalky, quite limestone rich, so really good for grapevines. But you also in Istria have kind of basically four soil types and you have these amazing rich red terra rossa soils as well. Um, and you have some grey soil and you have some black soils. And there is one winery called Katuna that does a series where they make uh, Malvasia from each of the four different soils that you can taste side by side and see see the differences and I would say probably the the black makes the heaviest and the white <laughs> makes the uh, most kind of fragrant um, um, style and the sort of grey and the black and the uh, red are somewhere in, in between and the terra rossa is obviously it seems to be pretty good for Tehran as well. And I say this is this is Momian, this is a view from Kozlovich. That's and this was a picture I took just it's not very far from Damianich. It was I went on a run from um Porech and thought, oh wow, that soil. I need a picture of that to show this red soil that's that's so amazing. But Damianich has got hundred year old vines on some red soil like this, but I didn't have a picture of it. But yeah, so we've gone from this sort of workhorse grape that made simple wine for sun, sea and sand to people really trying to understand how Malvasia uh, reflects the soil and give it and has a real sense of place. Um, hmm. uh, right, and then going completely the opposite um, end of the country um, to Slavonia and the Croatian Danube. The picture at the top there is a Tilok um, overlooking the, um, the Podromilok, which is a very old, cellar and a former state winery reinvented and then this is in the town of Ilok. I'd never been there before and it was just wow why don't people come here but actually it's a long way you know it's nearer to Budapest than it is to, to Zagreb if I, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And then this picture with the little hut this is over this is Krauthacker's vineyards that Daryl mentioned these are Grashevina vines um, sort of overlooking the Golden Valley and again I could find many more pictures of how beautiful it is around here, but um, just to give you a, an encouragement to um, <clears throat> to explore. Yeah, there's a question here about spearheading the revival of Malvasia. Yeah, I mean, Gianfranco Kozlovic has definitely been, been one of the, the leaders in that. Um, but, you know, they've been very organized. They're very cooperative, the guys in, um, and they are mostly guys, few women in Istria are about developing, you know, and even the big wineries, like if you look at the work that uh, Milan Budinsky has been doing at Vina Laguna as well, you know, big and small wineries have really progressed things enormously with this grape over the last few years. <clears throat> right, and then I wanted to just show you the Croatian uplands as well, which, so if you ever go to Zagreb, you'll see that and, and go visiting from there, this is, your nearest region. So the picture at the top is in Medjimurje, right? So the, the hills in the background are Slovenia, literally. So you've got these steep hills and terraces and like literally on the Slovenian border. So very quite similar styles to Eastern Slovenia with this very vibrant acidity and very good for, you know, Pushipel, which is the local name for Formin. There's some lovely aromatic 
fresh zesty sauvignons there as well um, and then the, and this was a traditional house in the region where which has a um, I did a it's a restaurant and a I did a tasting there and then this vineyard is Bolfans, right, Daryl? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's from Bolfan. And that's, by the way, just as a side point, that's also identical to the vineyard that uh, my family had. It, it looks like almost just like that, but that is a Bolfan. And that's in that area, Pleshevitsa. It's right in that, right near that area, very close. Mm -hmm. Also where Tomas is from. Yeah, and actually Pleshevitsa has been quite a dynamic area in terms of mm -hmm. developing sort of amphora wines and orange wines and Tom actually even does a sparkling orange wine, which is uh, which is quite amazing as well. Exactly. Um, well, fans biodynamic now, I think. Uh, but organic and using biodynamic methods anyway. I, I know he's organic. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And doing some quite... Um, um, you know, natural winemaking and so on. But there's quite a right. hodgepodge of people developing these different characters. The okay, thing so about I... it is, I, just to encourage, just to, sorry to interrupt real quickly, is it is such a close drive from Zagreb. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's a, is it a 25 kilometers or so, something like this. It's very close. You really, really, uh, I encourage anyone who goes to Zagreb to, would go and take a look at, at in that region in particular, and Pleshevica. The, the wineries are, are great. And those those wines, I mean, very, very innovative winemakers, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so now to again to highlight what a complex country this is. These are a couple of pictures I took of a grape variety called Babich at uh, Primoshten, which is UNESCO listed for these terraces of stone literally overlooking the sea. And you've got these fantastic old vines that are literally growing out of the rock um, and again it's another grape that has been used as a workhorse by one of the big former state wineries and then there are now some smaller wineries that are seeing its potential and in some ways it's perhaps a little bit more gentler and a little bit more forgiving than Plavak Mali which mm. everybody's heard of mm. um, but there are one or two producers like Leo Grassin, who's a professor at the University in Zagreb, who makes some fantastic wines. A new organic winery called Testaments, making some lovely stuff from Babich. Um, some quite uh, Babich, the great named after the, no different. I mean, it's Babich in New Zealand. It is a Croatian name, um, but I don't know whether they were named after the grape or or whatever. But um, so I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, but yeah you can see you know if you look at those green rolling hills we just I just showed you from the uplands down to these seriously rocky dry I mean this is really her heroic viticulture down in Dalmatia and again yeah. more pictures of quite how heroic um, growing grapes in uh, Dalmatia is so the top left hand corner is I took a photo when I, uh, on Brach, this was with Stina, and he, he took me up to the top of this vineyard and <laughs> kind of, it quite vertigo inducing standing at the top and looking down this slope and then the islands um, in the background over to Korchula and Pelajats. This is on far down in the bottom left-hand corner which shows you that it's not always sunny in Croatia, but I wanted to show you partly that it's very rocky, but also this problem or opportunity of these very higgledy-piggledy small plots of vineyards, which is both an opportunity for Croatia, but it's also challenging because you've got to work with, you know, these are each going to be owned by a different person that you've got to negotiate with to buy their grapes or their land off them or whatever yeah um and then the other two pictures are yours daryl <laughs> yeah this is uh in Peliasat, um uh the peninsula uh all in the same area okay and it's showing plavats mali it's showing plavats mali below you see it in in the summer okay before it's harvested and uh, on top in the um very very early spring i mean the Lavas Mali, it's a fascinating grape, okay, um, it creates very, it's a very thick skin grape and it creates very dense, highly tannic and uh, wines, it has very good tannins, high tannins, and it has, it can have high alcohol, okay, the wines are with high alcohol. 
with as much uh, incredible heat down there, okay, uh, the temperatures often reach 40 degrees. And not only do you have the direct sun hitting the vineyards, but the sun is also reflecting off of the water as well. And then with all that stony soil, here's a little bit of what I also have a little, <laughs> having to bring a piece back with me. I always keep it on my desk. Um, that limestone karst and, and it's it, heat is intensive. Uh, they grow, many of the Plavats uh, vines, they're grown as bushes okay, in, in bush form. So they're not trained on trellises. They're in bush form, many of them. And uh, as you can see, so they trim them back quite uh, strongly in the winter. Uh, and, um, but the wines are, uh, it's still, in my opinion, let's say for modern winemaking, it's still uh, a work in progress, but uh, it's definitely impressive now. When I say a work in progress, I mean, uh, say 20 years ago, it was very common to get big, heavy, jammy, thick uh, tannin filled wines. I mean, your tongue could hurt. <laughs> your lips would be stuck to your teeth from the tannins. And uh, 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 because they weren't paying necessary attention to say, you know, when the grapes are being harvested and all, the, all these other elements going into winemaking. But um, <clears throat> now you have some incredible winemakers, some very good wineries that are set up uh, who take care. You have organic uh, oriented wineries like Bilos, which is in the area called Ston, <laughs> uh, a part of the Palisades Peninsula. And uh, he really, really takes care. And you can, he makes fantastic, um, well, his wines are all spontaneously fermented. Uh, all he uses in terms of you no know, pesticides or herbicides, what he does use is okay, the copper and the sulfur. And uh, he follows as uh, little intervention as well. That's his uh, mode. It's worth mentioning on the organics, that there's a relatively new region called Kamana, where there's a group of six, seven, eight wide I can't remember exactly how many that are yes. all organic. And they all work together and there's some cracking, you know, very, some quite young winemakers who are really thinking about their styles. One yes. of the problems with Plavats is that it ripens unevenly. So if you want to avoid unripe tannins, some of the grapes are going to be really ripe. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I always think it's a bit of a dilemma because you're in this hot, sunny, you know, as you said, it can be 40 degrees on a sunny summer day. And you don't necessarily want big alcoholic red wines. So mm -hmm. I think that's possibly why Poship is coming to the fore a lot more and maybe more rosés are being made as well. So is it worth, do you want to comment on Poship? Well, very much so. But Poship and Gurk, I have to, because uh, even though it's so small. But, you know, it, it's um, in the island of Korchula, which is just maybe a 20-minute boat ride across from Eliasat, that area there that you see on an island, Cordula, there are two fantastic white grape varieties. One is Poship and one is Gurk, the GRK. But let me focus on Poship. Um, it has such, it's amazing because the area is so hot, but Poship makes such fantastically expressed wines, this white grape. Uh, you have a lot of um, beautiful, you have yellow fruit, but you also have other elements like the, the Mediterranean herbs, you can pick up uh, these, these aromas and flavors in it. Um, and it has a kind of an elegance uh, to it. Uh, and I'll mention that now because then I'll compare it to Gurk. Uh, but it also is made in many different styles. Okay, it's made as a fresh young drinking wine, white wine, the Poship. It's also made as a, a fuller bodied wine, oak aged barrel aged and it's also being made some there are a couple of winemakers who are doing a good job with it uh, in sparkling wines traditional method sparkling wines um it is it is really fantastic it's growing in sandy soils so you'll pick up this nice minerality uh, in the area as well and uh it's uh become so popular that now it's being grown in other parts uh of dalmatia uh not too far away but it is growing outside of um Portugal. The Gurk, I mentioned Gurk, which there are only about 15 to 20 hectares of this grape called Gurk, e -K. Um, but it's so fantastic, in my opinion, it is so individual. 
uh, that it's worth you at least having to try and taste it. And I say try and taste it because it obviously sells out very, very quickly. <laughs> and it's hard to get a hold of a good one. But they're excellent, talented winemakers on Cortula making both. Gurk has a little more of a fuller, fuller structure, if you will, a little bit rounder. And if I had to compare, if I can dare use this kind of analogy, say maybe the Poship, in my opinion, would be more going toward the feminine side and maybe the uh, Gurk would be a little more masculine if you will i think i can let you use those terms daryl we don't want any sexism in our tasting <laughs> well but you know what though and now here i have to do this because there is there is sex involved because the gurk is actually just female has a flea female flower and it cannot pollinate itself so which is why they plant it next to flavas mali <laughs> and flavas mali is the reason that um uh, grapes grow <laughs> and so and and now if you really want a, a, a good one um one of the uh one of the parents of Gurk, uh or descendants uh, one of its parents or not parents but one of its ancestors is i believe sir Lena kaslansky yeah. which is one yeah. of the you know uh, is primitivo trimidra oh. You're getting very incestuous. So <laughs> sex, yeah. this all has to be mentioned. You can't get away from it. Yeah, no, I know. No, really, I, just to, to come back to the point, though, I did because I know we're running out of time. But uh, I encourage uh, if there's any way for you to try Poship and Gurk, these two white wines, and they are the acidity is is very good, but it's not by any means out of out of uh, the atmosphere, <laughs> and um, the alcohol is generally you know quite good it's it's a moderate i wouldn't say it's very high like plavats mali you should know plavats mali easily it's 14 15 some go up to 17 percent alcohol mm. with plavats mali and the red grape okay the you can mind i'm defining so uh but with these whites you you don't have that issue and you can find some excellent examples of sparkling dry oak aged uh steel fermented the whole game so it, it's really uh impressive that this is all and think about it this is all within a yeah. not, Dalmatia is huge but the area we're talking about right now it's all within a contained the uh, location you know it's not it's not gargantuan by any means no not at all except that for most of these wines you're actually going to have to go to Croatia and find them because yeah. they you know they've been able to sell them at actually quite comfortable prices in Croatia to tourists, but there are some importers. Croatian premium wine is um, on the for the USA. Croatia and packed in Canada, and you've got Croatian fine wines in the UK that import um, some wines, but they're not wines that you find in mainstream retailers because they're not cheap. Because why why do they need to be right? Um, so I think we need to encourage you to go and visit the place and taste mm. the wines in situ and understand how they connect to mm. these very different landscapes mm. and, you know, where you can find them um, in the, you know, in your markets, then, you know, there's so much, you know, it's fantastic diversity and so much to discover. Um, Eric, question here the future of Pushipel in Dalmatia that's a very good question I mean, you know push everybody knows Pushipel is the local is the Mejimuria name for Furmint I don't think anybody's ever planted it in Dalmatia that I know of Do you, um, um, but yeah be interesting it's not really a hot climate grape though I don't think so um, but you know who knows um i mean i come across one or two people experimenting with all sorts of interesting things just just to find out but um some of the more innovative producers i mean oh gosh i mean the guys in komana particularly mm. for dalmatia i think uh volarovic volarovic he yeah. is excellent he has his doctorate and he really approaches yeah. He has tried so many different things. His experimentation is fantastic. Yeah. Different, different. He, for example, he um, uh, he he uses different. Uh, okay, he goes through maybe two or three harvests, you know, uh, and he'll put them in different kinds of barrels. He's trying everything he can, and he's very intelligent, and it's really working. His wines are lovely. Yeah. Volarovic in in Komarna. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. 
Um, I think I can't not mention Joe Ahern on Hvar, mm. who's a British winemaker who's set herself up with um, a small winery to make sort of handcrafted wines from things like, you know, she uses Danakusha to make a fantastic rosé called named after her grandmother called Roshina. And she makes a very elegant modern style of plavach as well, which she says she selects to within an inch of its life to try and get, you know, those properly ripe berries without being overripe or underripe. And she's doing a really interesting skin fermented wine called Wild Skins with Poship and Bogdanusha and and uh, Park, Perk, I think, as well in there as well. So, so she's she's really exciting. Um, Very good. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think um, when, question well, about sparkling wines sparkling. as well. Um, Korak, Semba. Yeah, um, uh, she, yeah, it's pronounced Shemba, like Shemba, and uh, Tomats. Tomats, yes, um, especially his orange sparkling is very good. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got a couple of people in Istria. Uh, Cabola makes a really nice um, Malvasia based traditional method sparkling. Um, right. Yeah. Where was that other? Um, oh, who's the neighbor? He's the, uh, you know, he's a little bit over from. Tomats and uh, Schember. Uh, not Griffin. Is it Griffin? Not Griffin. Um, oh, Griffin, anyway. yeah. And there's an Ivan Hitch as well. Yeah. Uh, Schember. I said Cab we said Cabola. Um, oh, stop it. Autocorrect. <laughs> um, and then there's also a bit, a little bit of sparkling wine being made here from Furmint in um, Medjimurie as well. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to clean out of my head who the producers are. <laughs> yeah, Furmint, yeah. 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 There's not, because there really is very little ferment, isn't it? Push it there are very little amounts, right? In the yeah, whole country. I mean, it's 130 odd hectares. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Sailing in September from Split. I would definitely go to, I would go to Brach, definitely, mm. Mm. which is, because um, then you can go and see, which is the island. So you can go and see uh, Stina, who also, uh, you know, makes some really modern interpretations of Croatian wines, like uh, they do a nice Vugavar, uh, really nice Poship at various levels. They've got a Tribu Dragon, they're obviously Plavats Mali. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got uh, Senkovic as well on Brac, mm -hmm. uh, a really lovely small family winery. So a couple of options there. Mm -hmm. Very... And VAR is not too far away. I think VAR is uh, an HVAR is not too far away. You can see, you can visit uh, Plankovic. Um, uh, wait, where's Joe Ahern? Joe Ahern, she's on VAR, isn't she? Joe's on VAR, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's try and not do the autocorrect thing there. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, H -V yeah. That's <laughs> yes. oh, Island, yeah. So, and you've got um, Tomic as well on, on VAR as well. So mm. a few options there. And on Havar, you've got this fantastic um, the Starry Grad Plain, which has this uh, you know, system of walls and enclosures that date back about uh, um, centuries. Century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a UNESCO site as well, isn't it? Oh, right. I, uh, is, uh, I, mm. Mm. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm sure it is. But so sure. those would be. And Korchula, obviously, to go and see the uh, you know, push up and, and that's a must. And that's a that must. Is really <laughs> that is a must. I tell you, that is that's one area yeah, that yeah. I just think is phenomenal. And there are a lot of other grapes that we didn't even touch mm. that are grown there as well, that are fantastic. And, the, and there's a, a very good uh, another thing to point out in all of this area, including Corchula, is you have this great young generation that are really, really bringing back. They're helping to bring back these uh, grape varieties. And by the way, this is a little another nerdy side point is being that Plavats Mali is the cross between Sorliana uh, Kastelanski and uh, Dobrocic. There are Dobrocic itself, which is very little of, is being revived. And there are some interesting versions of Dobrocic starting to come. And that's something to look forward to. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm not sure I've tasted any yet. So that would be yeah. to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, so 
Wonderful. I'm I'm fine. I think we've got three minutes to go for our hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so yeah. Um, so unless yeah. there are any further questions, um, we, we need to bring this wonderful double act to a close. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been absolutely splendid. Um, both the information and also the presentation, because it just makes things so much more appealing um, when you're when the the speakers engage the audience in the way you both have. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we're all keeping our fingers crossed that the travel restrictions will ease and we will be able to join Lynn and anyone else who's uh, traveling to Croatia um, in the summer or autumn. In the meanwhile, uh, we wish all the winemakers well and um, hope they carry on producing such intriguing wines. Caroline, Daryl, thank you very much indeed.